Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. Our show is a production of our non profit organization, the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation, or THCF, and our affiliated political committee, Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp, or CRRH. We have an exciting show for you tonight. Mr. John Cornett is here to provide musical accompaniment. We have a lot of news stories, a bunch of breakthroughs. This is our first live show in about a month. Our producer uh, had to go to Thailand to train some people on some technical things, but he's back. And so we're back, and we'll be back, uh, looks like, almost every single Friday night from now, at least through uh, the end of April, looks like we're scheduled for it right now, or maybe the end of March. But uh, as we always do, let's start with our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. Ta-da. I feel the force. start with our hemp news segment tonight. We've got a lot of interesting stories for you. According to a new report, this will come as no surprise to us, the drug war disproportionately targets African Americans in 96% uh, of large counties. From Washington, D.C., a new report released Tuesday by the Justice Policy Institute states that 193 out of 198 counties studied in prison African Americans at a markedly higher rate for drug offenses. The report found that African Americans are ten times more likely to be imprisoned for a drug offense, despite the fact that whites and African Americans use and sell drugs at comparable rates. In addition, the report found no correlation between the rate at which people are sent to prison and the rate at which drugs are used in a given county. Instead, high county drug prison admission rates were associated with the size of the county police and judiciary budgets, the proportion of the county's population that is African American, and higher poverty and unemployment levels. In 2002, over half of the 175,000 people admitted to prison for drug offenses nationwide were African American, according to the report. African Americans make up less than 13 percent of the U.S. population, but over half of the drug offenses that are incarcerated. The authors cite differences in availability of drug treatment for African Americans compared to whites, mandatory minimum sentencing laws, and disparate treatment by police and the courts as the factors contributing to the racial disparities in drug imprisonment rates. In response to their findings, the authors call for a de-escalation of the drug war, a comprehensive policy review, and reform of the current drug law enforcement practices that are focused in the African American community. They also urge increased funding in public services to help curb drug addiction. Rather than focus law enforcement efforts on drug-involved people who bear little threat to public safety, we should free up local resources to fund treatment, job training, supportive housing, and other effective public safety strategies. The full text of this report, uh, The Vortex, The Concentrated Racial Impact of Drug Imprisonment and the Characteristics of Punitive Counties, is available online at justicepolicy.org. That's justicepolicy.org. From uh, California and Colorado, there are a couple of exciting cases where medical patients have received their cannabis back after it had been seized by uh, the authorities. The California Court of Appeals has upheld a lower court decision ordering Garden Grove Police in California to return one-third of an ounce of cannabis obtained legally under California's Proposition 215 to Felix Ka, a medical cannabis patient. Garden Grove's attorneys appealed the earlier ruling by the Supreme Court of Orange County, uh, Superior Court of Orange County, arguing that returning the marijuana violated federal laws against marijuana distribution. The Court of Appeals in California rejected this argument, noting the separation between federal and state law and stating that neither state courts nor state law enforcement are charged with enforcing federal law. 
court wrote, quote, Garden Grove police will actually be facilitating a primary principle of federalism, which is to allow the states to innovate in areas bearing on the health and well-being of their citizens, end quote. In a similar case from Fort Collins, Colorado, the police returned 39 dead cannabis plants along with paraphernalia to James and Lisa Masters, patients at THCF's medical clinic in uh, Colorado. And they received it 16 months after they were arrested and their medicinal cannabis was confiscated. Brian Vincente, an attorney for Masters and the executive director of Sensible Colorado, a marijuana reform group in Denver, stated that the exchange represented the largest amount of seized medicinal cannabis ever returned. The Masters now are threatening to sue the Fort Collins police for failing to preserve their plants during the 16-month stay with law enforcement. The Masters are seeking monetary compensation for their property in excess of $100,000. Article 18, Section 14 of the Colorado State Constitution states that, quote, any property used in connection with the medical use of marijuana shall not be harmed, neglected, injured, or destroyed while in the possession of the state or local law enforcement officials, end quote. So that's an exciting breakthrough uh, in Colorado that we're happy to hear about there. Our next story is from Wisconsin. From Waukesha, Wisconsin, Waukesha County supervisors voted 27-4 to 4 this week to decriminalize cannabis possession for first-time offenders. Under the new policy, law enforcement officials may cite, rather than arrest, individuals found in possession of small quantities of cannabis. Those charged under the ordinance face a fine, but no criminal sanctions. Under state law in Wisconsin, possession of any amount of cannabis is a misdemeanor offense punishable by up to six months in jail. County supervisors there in Wisconsin said that criminally prosecuting minor cannabis offenders was placing an undue burden on local police and clogging the county courts. Other regions of the state have enacted similar cannabis decriminalization policies, including the cities of Madison, Wisconsin, and Milwaukee County. Since 1973, 12 state legislatures have adopted versions of marijuana decriminalization, replacing jail time with a fine-only penalty, including Oregon and California. Here we have a couple of stories on Sativex, the uh, real cannabis extract that's being developed in England by GW Pharmaceuticals and recently backed by Bayer, the aspirin company. From New York City, 40 medical centers across North America will take part in the first ever U.S. clinical trial assessing the efficacy of Sativex, an oral spray consisting of natural cannabis extracts for the treatment of advanced cancer pain. More than 300 patients with advanced stage cancer will be recruited for the five-week trial, which will assess the use of Sativex as an adjunct treatment for patients with intractable cancer pain. Subjects in the trial must have a clinical diagnosis of cancer-related pain and must be unresponsive to opioid-based analgesics. Investigators in the study will be using an 11-point numeric rating scale to determine whether patients' reported pain scores have fallen by the completion of the trial. Russell Portnoy, chief investigator of the study and chairman of the Department of Pain, Medicine, and Palliative Care at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York City, said, quote, more than one-third of patients with cancer and more than three-quarters of those with advanced disease have chronic pain. Large surveys indicate that optimal opioid therapy does not yield sufficient relief in a substantial portion of these patients. There's a clear need for new treatments to improve these outcomes, and it's our hope that cannabinoid formulations may represent an important option in the future." End quote. In previous clinical trials of the drug, cancer patients have reported significantly improved pain relief following Sativex administration. Earlier this month, investigators in Britain reported that long-term administration of Sativex reduces neuropathic pain without inducing tolerance in patients with multiple sclerosis, or MS. Canadian health officials granted regulatory approval in August for the prescription use of Sativex to treat cancer pain. Sativex had previously gained regulatory approval in Canada for the treatment of MS-associated neuropathic pain. Regulators in Great Britain and Spain have also granted limited regulatory approval for the drug. The makers of Sativex, the British-based biotechnology firm GW Pharmaceuticals, told Bloomberg News that they expect to have results from the trial next year and are hopeful that they'll receive U.S. regulatory approval for the drug by 2011. And from uh, Liverpool, 
the long-term administration of Sativex, an oral spray consisting of natural cannabis extracts, reduces neuropathic pain without inducing tolerance in multiple sclerosis patients, according to clinical trial data published in the Journal of Clinical Therapeutics. 28 patients completed the two-year open-label extension trial. The investigators reported that patients required fewer daily doses of Sativex and reported lower median pain scores the longer they took the drug. The authors also reported that the drug's administration was not associated with an increase in the patient's use of other analgesics, noting that several of the study's participants reduced or ceased their use of pharmaceutical pain medications while taking Sativex. It's been estimated that more than one out of four MS patients suffer from neuropathic pain. The investigators concluded, quote, Sativex was effective with no evidence of tolerance in patients with central neuropathic pain and MS who completed two years of treatment. Uh, the use of Sativex per se did not lead to a major increase in the use of new analgesics, which over at least two years is a further indirect measure of sustained effectiveness in this population, end quote. Previously reported data on the long-term efficacy of Sativex has shown the drug to decrease spasticity and bladder dysfunction in patients with MS. So uh, that's the end of that story. And uh, let's see, we have another one here. That's from uh, the September issue of Clinical Therapeutics called, quote, Oral Mucosal Delta-9 Tetrahydrocannabinol or Cannabidiol for Neuropathic Pain Associated with Multiple Sclerosis, an Uncontrolled Open-Label Two-Year Extension Trial, end quote. From San Francisco, cannabis may offer a non-toxic alternative to chemotherapy. Administration of the non-psychoactive cannabinoid cannabidiol or CBD inhibits the spread of breast cancer, according to preclinical data published this month in the journal Molecular Cancer Therapeutics. Investigators at California Pacific Medical Center Research Institute reported that CBD, or cannabidiol, limits the activity of the breast cancer metastasis gene ID1. The researchers noted that CBD downregulated ID1 expression in human breast cancer cells more effectively than did the administration of the cannabinoid THC, CBG, or CBN, which is cannabigerol and cannabinol, and or the synthetic uh, cannabinoid agonist WIN55. Uh, the lead researcher, Sean McAllister, told the BBC News investigators, quote, cannabidiol offers hope of a non-toxic therapy that could treat aggressive forms of cancer without any of the painful side effects of chemotherapy. Uh, the investigator added, quote, CBD could potentially moderate the spread of other common forms of cancer, including colon cancer and prostate cancer, by modulating similar pathways, end quote. Researchers at Italy's Institute di Chimica Biomecular, excuse my Italian, had previously reported that CBD administration moderated the spread of breast cancer cells by triggering apoptosis, or programmed cell death. Separate studies have demonstrated that cannabinoids can inhibit cancer cell growth in animals and in culture on a wide range of tumoral cell lines, including pancreatic cancer carcinoma and lung carcinoma. Most recently, investigators at uh, Madrid's Computense University School of Biology reported in the British Journal of Cancer that THC administration decreases recurrent glioblastoma multiform brain tumor growth in patients diagnosed with that disease. Previous preclinical trials on CBD have shown the compound to be neuroprotective against alcohol-induced brain damage, stroke, and mad cow disease. Full text of this study, cannabidiol is a novel inhibitor of ID1 gene expression in aggressive breast cancer cells, end quote, appears in the journal Molecular Cancer Therapeutics. The price of cannabis is falling, according to the federal government. Domestic marijuana production has risen dramatically in recent years and will likely result in reduced retail prices for cannabis, according to the National Drug Intelligence Center's 2008 National Drug Threat Assessment Report. The uh, report finds, quote, recent increases in cannabis cultivation and marijuana production within the United States coincide with the continued flow of marijuana from foreign sources, 
This may lead to market saturation in major markets, which could reduce the price of the drug significantly. End quote. Since 2000, the total number of domestic marijuana plants seized by U.S. law enforcement has increased from 2.8 million to over 5.2 million, the report finds. The authors speculate that a significant portion of the increase in cannabis production is due to commercial growers relocating their operations indoors, which allows them to increase their total harvest numbers uh, per year and produce higher quality cannabis. Uh, the report concludes, quote, Though the demand for marijuana appears to be relatively stable, many users now prefer higher potency marijuana over commercial grain marijuana. And the report concludes that most of the marijuana available in the United States continues to be lower potency commercial grade marijuana produced in Mexico. In 2006, law enforcement seized more than 1.1 million kilograms of cannabis along the U.S. southwest border, according to the study. By contrast, law enforcement seized fewer than 4,200 kilograms of cannabis along the U.S.-Canadian border. Domestically, California continues to lead all U.S. states in cannabis production, with an estimated 2.9 million plants having been eradicated by law enforcement so far this year. This record total is more than four times the total number of plants seized in 2005. Among California counties, Lake County, Humboldt County, and Shasta County report the largest number of cannabis seizures. That's the end of our hip news segment tonight. We have Mr. John Cornett standing by here. How are you doing this week, John? I'm doing very good. Thank you, Paul. I know Tim uh, couldn't make it here, and I appreciate you coming in to sit in while he's a little ill. You're very welcome. Uh, Tim fell to... Um an onion. A deadly onion <laughs> caused, uh, what is it, some kind of anaphylactic shock? Yeah, that's what I heard. And I'm well, going to honor him tonight playing one of his songs. All right. Go right ahead. Thank you. in there. Thank you, John. That's Mr. John Cornett. And so uh, we will be taking your calls this evening. It is the 7th of December, Pearl Harbor Day, for those historians out there, of uh, 2007. So we'll be taking your calls right up to the top of the hour. You can call us at 503-288-4448. That's 503-288-4448. 48, and we'll be taking your calls and questions and lots of other interesting things. Uh, since Tim's not here, we, I'm going to fly solo tonight, so I hope you enjoy that. We've got uh, some classes we want to tell you about. Our uh, THCF Medical Clinic is offering a number of classes, and uh, you can find out about those uh, by calling our office at 503 Two three five four six zero six. That's five zero three two three five four six zero six. We've got a call now. We'll go back to those classes in just a moment. Hello, caller. You're on the show. Hello. We need a little more sound in the studio. You know, we're all volunteers here. This is an all volunteer show. Even though I'm up here on the camera, there's a crew of about. A dozen people behind the cameras and in the control room that are all here on a volunteer basis, as am I, trying to get this show out there to bring you information about ending adult marijuana prohibition, restoring industrial hemp, and helping medical marijuana patients. Is that call still there? I'm still here. Okay. Hey, I can hear you now. Good evening. 
How are you doing tonight? Very well. How are you? Very well. Um, about four, what, what happened was I got pulled over about four weeks ago for a, a seatbelt ticket. I see. And um, he smelled something, so I automatically gave it to him. You know, without. Do you have a medical marijuana permit? Yes. Uh, well, what had happened is it expired about um, eight days earlier. I thought ah. it expired at the end of October. It uh-huh. expired at the end of uh, uh, September. Right. And I think this was like October 4th or 5th. I have yet to I go see. to court on it yet. I go to court uh, the um, 14th of this month. But I pleaded not guilty because I have renewed my card, and I was Great. wondering what I can expect. You can expect that your uh, charge should be thrown out, and uh, you might even get your medicine back. I you hope should so. ask for that. I hope so, because it was just a gram. I mean, actually, all I want is my utensils back. Uh-huh. I had a container that I asked the officer back. And at the time, he was going to give it back to me, but it all kind of got lost. And You know, it was really funny. For one gram, they had three officers there. Uh-huh. That's pretty crazy. Yes, sir. Okay, that's So I they just why. found they could smell the... You hadn't been smoking, though, thank goodness. I had taken one hit, and I told him that. Uh huh. So he didn't charge you with any kind of driving offense? No, he actually um, gave me a test and let me go. I see. Well, that's great. Yeah. I felt pretty we good about it, We usually recommend too. people don't drive in your car and don't smoke in your car. Uh, you could get charged with the same thing as driving under the influence of alcohol or... Uh, well, I told him. I told him the fact that I, w- I was not driving. I told him that I had pulled over. I took one hit because I had had a headache because I got my card for glaucoma. Yeah. And I'd taken one hit and, um, you know, had pulled out of the parking lot and just forgot to put my seatbelt on, which... I understand. He smiled. Well, they can get you for that here in Oregon. I guess in Washington they have to have something else to pull you over for outside of seatbelts, but here in Oregon they can just pull you over for that. Since you brought that up, that reminds me, for glaucoma relief, you don't have to even smoke cannabis. You can eat something made out of the leaf, which won't give you the high associated with cannabis if that's not convenient, such as the time that you're driving. What we have right here is an alcohol-based extract of cannabis leaves and flowers. If you want the a high associated with cannabis, you can make it out of flowers. However, it's the CBD or cannabidiol in cannabis that provides the primary relief for glaucoma. Also, it's the primary active ingredient for pain, spasms, and seizures. So for people who have glaucoma, pain, spasms, and seizures, they can eat a compound of uh, an extract from the leaves, or you cook the leaves at a real low temperature for about well, 15 minutes. Well, I'll tell minutes. you what. Um, up until nine months ago, I had a prescription for 90 Vicodin a month. Oh I my no goodness. longer have a prescription and I don't use it. All right. Um, I have well, a I'm sure that's that really a good thing to get off of. 90 Vicodin a month would really knock you out, wouldn't it? It's, uh, uh, it you know, I got into it with some cops one time. They called me a drug addict, so I yeah. wanted to prove to them I wasn't. Well, a lot of times, you know, they, they give you these prescriptions and get you hooked on this stuff, and then they pull the plug and call you a drug addict. That's, that's unfortunately basically kind of the way happened. it happens in, in the medical field often these days. Well, thank you very much for your information. Sure. Thanks for your call. It was a great uh, point to bring up. I'm glad uh, they didn't charge you with driving, and hopefully you'll get your cannabis back and get those charges thrown out. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, We are taking your calls tonight. Uh, If you want to call us, the number is 503-288-4448. That's 503-288-4448. And there's the number on your screen. There's our little part of the THCF uh, Medical Clinics Museum, where we've got some of that up online now. You can link to it from hemp.org. And there's a little bit of food we'll go through and, and show and tell with some of these items just a little bit. But if you have a question for us, give us that call. Um, the classes that we're offering at uh, the THC Cannabis Resource Center, we're offering them every Wednesday night. There's one on beginning gardening. Most of these classes require that you have a medical marijuana permit, either from Oregon or Washington, to be able to take those classes. Uh, We also have outdoor gardening, advanced gardening, making medical grade hashish, and administering medical marijuana safely. There's one class we offer, Understanding Oregon's Medical Marijuana Law, that does not require the state permit. But we have another caller. Hello, caller. You're on the show. Hello, caller. Can you hear me? Yes. Are you there? I am. Yes, I wanted to ask two questions, Paul. Go right ahead. I've been with you since the houses. Oh, yeah, before we had a real office. Yes, sir. And we 
We greatly appreciate uh, everything you did. And, and I remember still, rolling around on the floor in the morning and picking up my kids' food and, and toys before we had our clinics on those days. Well, our kids went to the same school, and we'd occasionally run into each other after I school. I remember you, yeah, back when they were in uh, preschool and kindergarten. Yeah, and I, I just when. wanted to, uh, I was curious, of where is uh, uh, the collection going to go? Is it your private collection? or No, is it's it the Foundation's be, uh, collection. Uh, and it is currently just coming in and being shown on the TV show and remains in storage. We want a real secure location. Uh, might go into our office. We just have to make sure it's secure. Uh, it's a pretty expensive collection. Our foundation's got about seventy to eighty thousand dollars into it right now. Just this little assortment you see here is about two thousand dollars worth. So we'll be having it in our clinics at some point, but right now. We've got a number of the bottles up on uh, uh, the internet on that hemp dot. You can link to it from hemp.org. Still there? Yes. Uh, and the the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, um, I think what should be pointed out, which you know you can't answer everything because you're in the mode of the program. I mean, you do your best up there and have yeah, I add done ever since I can. you started, but. Um, it would have been good if you, we could have told this man not to have admitted to have smoked any. Yeah, the, yeah. You know, too. But it is. Well, he's lucky know, he didn't get charged spot, with DUI, you know. so he sounds like he he had a good uh, officer there. Of course, you yeah. know the aroma between smoked cannabis and unsmoked uh, cannabis or vaporized cannabis is radically different, and the the smell of smoking lingers much longer than the smell of uh, just raw fresh cannabis. So and one other question is I I know all of the top players that uh you know uh, have clinics and are really in the movement uh -huh. and I feel that there is really a lot it's not it's not really unhealthy competition but it seems like there's really a riff and it seemed like it started basically after dawn uh, and I mean, it was coming on a little bit, but uh, can you tell me more in the audience more of where is the condition with Don and what he's the havoc he's created in the movement? Well, you know, uh, my understanding is uh, the federal government uh, came in and searched his house and took a bunch of his plants, but he hasn't been charged. We received, you know, a subpoena for 17 patient records. Uh, I went public with that, as the subpoena instructed me not to, but I did. And uh, the ACLU came and stepped in and helped us with an incredibly talented legal team. And then the federal judge in eastern Washington quashed the subpoena. And the judge actually ruled, quote, uh, THCF's clinic is integral to the success and implementation of the state program. So I'm, I'm real proud of that. Uh, Finding and ruling by uh, Judge Whalen there in uh, Eastern Washington. He's the chief judge of Eastern Washington. But currently, I don't believe anything further is going on with Don. I haven't heard of anything yet, anyway. That's where it's at. Uh, and how's your wife? She's doing well. Thank you for asking. You know, she's a, a recovering breast cancer uh, survivor, and she's doing very well. She's here in the Excellent. audience tonight. Well, we do you have an audience have here. Weekend, and thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Yeah, we do have an audience here. So if you're out there and you want to come down here any Friday night uh, to our TV studio, you're welcome. We're even uh, got a little after show get together that we're starting to open up to the public uh, that uh, we'll be announcing more of here in the coming weeks. But uh, uh, you're welcome to come down and watch the show. And then there's an after show get together just a mere mile away from our TV studio, which is just off of MLK, our Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. We have a roll-in, a tape that we're going to roll now, and uh, I'll be back to discuss it with you. And we are still taking your calls, so call us at 503-288-4448. And we'll roll that tape.
All we are saying is give Pat a chance. Let my life live in freedom. We all have the right to smoke weed. Let my life live in freedom. We all have the right to smoke weed. Senseless, endless, wasteful war on drugs. Um, what was the other point I just had? Totally slipped my mind. That's terrible. One more thing I want to say right now. The new generation are stronger, smarter, wiser, and more prettier and beautiful. We need to end this culture of fear that is being perpetrated in Washington based upon the so-called war on drugs. You are in the front ranks trying to change those laws in intelligent, reasonable, progressive ways to benefit the people of America. To be an effective lobbyist, you absolutely need to believe in, in, in what you're lobbying for. I'm very fortunate in the sense that I deeply believe in the issue for which I'm advocating. Congress in 60 days will be voting on whether or not to stop arresting cancer patients and AIDS patients who use medical marijuana in states, which have allowed medical marijuana laws to pass. Okay, cool. Can you just verbally brief me really quickly what's... Uh... My goal is to get 218 votes on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives for the hinchy Warbacher medical marijuana amendment. Going with 236 mass We want to pass this amendment. We're, we're not playing around. We're, we're aiming to actually legalize medical marijuana. The fact that our federal government wants to arrest people for using the medicine that works for them that their doctors have recommended that's legal under state law is an outrage. It's, it's, an, it's a moral outrage. Oh, how are you, sir? Good. Nice to see you. Hey, um, sir, I'm curious if there's anything that would cause you to, to change your vote on the medical marijuana amendment. You voted against it last year, and I was curious if there's uh, any chance that you would support it this year. This job is about building relationships. I'm good. How are you? How are things going? So I basically try to become their friend. Hey, good luck. Take care. Thanks, Congressman. All right. See ya. And it's always trying to get that message out there as quickly as possible. Congressman Wilson? Hey, I'm Aaron Houston with the Marijuana Policy Project. I'm sorry? Aaron Houston with the Marijuana Policy Project. I was actually in your district in 2004. Uh, very good to see you. Good to see you, Congressman. That happens a lot. It's great to see you again, Congressman. With, with There's a stigma attached to marijuana. How do you make politicians feel comfortable supporting this? How do you make them feel like they can actually come out and take a strong stand on it? We've poured a considerable amount of resources into passing the amendment, hitting the GOP congressmen who have not supported the amendment in the past. It can be such a um, such a, a difficult issue to convince people on Congressman. Believe it or not, there's a bunch of politicians around here in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> this town's all about you scratch my back, I'll scratch. Mm -hmm. Well, we give contributions. <laughs> we give money to, to good guys. <laughs> Congressman, you're a scholar and a gentleman. Thank you. One person in a suit with a short haircut, able to give PAC contributions and able to intelligently talk to members of Congress and their staff members, uh, is far, far more powerful than having a hundred or a thousand or even possibly tens of thousands of people in the street. I just thought I'd uh, give you a quick update on, on what we're doing. And Congressman Hinchy is the prime sponsor of the Hinchy Rohrbacher Medical Marijuana Amendment. He's in a very strongly Democratic district, uh, so he has the latitude to say some things and to, and to do things that, that possibly other members might want to do but, but can't do uh, because of the districts that they're in. And so we're going to continue to push it hard until we get it passed. And I think we do have a good chance of getting it passed this year. I think so, too. The citizens of these United States have already made up their minds on medical marijuana. It's a consistent finding whether they get a chance to vote for it in a state ballot initiative or whether they're polled on it. Everybody says it's 
not just cruel and not just unusual, it's insane to be denying to sick people something that is of proven medical efficacy. That ought to be the end of the argument right there. The DEA does not recognize any initiative anywhere in the United States that promotes marijuana as a safe, harmless drug that can be used for medicinal purposes. The issue of medical marijuana is not something that ought to be decided by popular referendum. I'm, I'm really pleased by it. We have a whole scientific process that served this country damn well for a long, long time in determining that. You know, and, and, and you can make horrendous mistakes. There is a system, and it's basically at the Food and Drug Administration. That's where the issue of medical marijuana should be decided, and it should be decided by doctors and scientists. The reason people have not... All right, well, that was Joseph Califano there at the very end. Of course, he receives lots of money to oppose cannabis uh, decriminalization and medical marijuana. There were some interesting things. They had Ron Paul in there, Democratic uh, representative from Houston, Texas, who's running for the Republican nomination for U.S. president, and Maurice Hinchy. And uh, there was a march that it started out with there in New York City. That fellow in black is David Peel who uh, has written several marijuana songs and was an associate of uh, John Lennon back when he was alive, back in the 70s and 80s. And uh, you can get some of David Peel's, uh, I think his biggest hit was, uh, I Like Marijuana. Yep. So if you have a question for us out there tonight, you can call us at 503-288-4448. That's 503-288-4448. I'm going to go through with our little show and tell here tonight. We have things bookend with some, some homemade medicine man created cannabis tincture. And uh, as you can see, this has a real oily residue here at the top of the bottle when you turn that over. That is some very potent tincture. Now, this is from Maryland Company. This is a cannabis uh, indica powdered extract, which you would get in this, and this is a 1890s bottle, would be powdered hashish used for a lot of different things. Now this is a generic uh, bottle from the 1870s to 1880s for uh, cannabis tincture. So you'd find this stuff in these bottles. A lot of these bottles would have had an alcohol-based cannabis tincture. This one was filled. This is a Doug bottle from Tennessee, dug out of a, a pit and uh, it is embossed and it says cannabis indica from a pharmaceutical house in uh, Philadelphia. This one is uh, one of the many, about a half dozen different cannabis concoctions from Eli Lilly. Eli Lilly, how did powdered cannabis extract and a few different formulations of tinctures. These next two bottles are from Sharp and Dome, which like Eli Lilly is still around here today. This first one was uh, a cannabis tincture, just what you'd find in this bottle over here. And uh, that is a good pint-sized bottle. This is a migraine medicine. It says four migraines, and it contained cannabis, and uh, also from Sharp and Doan in uh, Baltimore. And this one is specific medicines. Uh, this is uh, made all over the United States. It's American hemp. This one would have been filled with marijuana flower tops, and so it could be made into a tincture or used. And then here we have something picked up at a local health food store: healthy hemp uh, bagels with lots of omega-3 and 6 and 9 and uh, uh, the mighty hemp seed with 40 percent protein content is comprised of all nine essential amino acids so you get good healthy vegan alternative food from hemp seed and the healthy bagels and here of course another bottle of this homemade tincture that uh, we do provide to our patients so there's our end of our show and tell or sharing portion of our show tonight. And we have another caller. Hello, caller. You are on the show. Good evening, Paul. How are you this evening? Very well. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. I had a couple things I wanted to mention and, and uh, a very important question about the awards coming up. Okay. Go right ahead. Uh, first of all, I wanted to mention that over the process of time watching uh, your program, uh, got me to thinking about industries that legalized hemp would impact. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Notice I did not say hurt. Yeah. Might compete with, but I don't think it would be hurting these industries. But yeah, first I'd have help forestry. Really. 
I mean, for instance, the energy industry. We're talking about something that's dramatically less toxic than petrochemicals. Oh yeah. Well, I'm I'm going to get to that one. But okay, go I'm right starting, ahead. Starting starting with forestry, since I'm obviously a native Oregonian, as are you. Yeah. Uh, forestry for paper, obviously. Uh, petrochemical industry, uh, because hemp fiber would uh, probably serve as a replacement uh, for nylon and reduce our use of, of uh, petrochemicals in that way, and plastics. Pharmaceutical industry, of course. The agricultural industry, which you just made a point of uh, with yeah. the hemp food there, with the hemp seed. You can give farmers a very valuable new crop. Yeah, as well as the oil and the meal uh, for food. Yeah. How about the cotton and textile industry? Hemp would uh, is ideal as a fiber or for making cloth. It's true. Uh, how about the alcohol uh, distillery, brewery type industries? Mm -hmm. They have a little uh, bit of competition, at least. Yeah, the, you know. If hemp was allowed recreationally, then then they would probably oppose that. Uh, the tobacco industry would oppose it because uh, uh, marijuana is a uh, less toxic alternative if someone chooses to smoke. Mm -hmm. With me so far? Yeah, I'm still here. You're okay. Uh, these other ones I I don't like to mention, but. You know they would be impacted by legalizing hemp. You have to have to think about what this list is for. The prison industry. There's one I sure like to see uh, get a lot less money than they've been getting. Yeah, it's the, kind of a shame that you know the United States has one well, of the high well the highest incarceration rate in the, in the world. You know we have more people in prison than Russia does. And the the fact of the matter is the people that we have in in uh, prison are well if. They could lose 70% of their inmates if marijuana was legalized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's my estimate. Another industry that would be impacted is the law enforcement industry because they could lose the revenue that they receive due to uh, uh, yeah, drug seizures and property forfeitures. Sure. If, those, if, if hemp was legal, those would stop. That would impact their revenue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh the smuggling industry would also be impacted. Yep. You know, many the time market. when I've been out petitioning to end adult marijuana prohibition back in the 90s, when I had someone say, oh, that'll put me out of business. Now, what I actually heard from that is, I'm too stupid to survive in a uh, legal environment or something. You know, I've got to take advantage of uh, the black market to be able. But, you know, I never told the people that. I just say, okay, I'll get somebody else to sign the petition. Yep. I, I, here's another one uh, that. It was just brought to mind by what you just showed in the uh, tape, lobbyists. All of those industries that I just mentioned have lobbyists. Sure. Do they not? Sure. You bet they do. So that's another industry that would be negatively impacted. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All but, right. So there's a, a number of, of people that need to be... Um, Either have Aware. the teeth removed from their tigers or else make them realize that it's really a harmless plant. Yeah. Now, did you have a question, too? Yes, I did. Here's the question. Uh, I, I was surprised that Madeline wasn't there with you because I thought there would be some mention of the... Uh, the Oregon Medical Cannabis Awards, where she's going to be here along with Keith Strop next week. You know, Keith Strop is the founder of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws way back in 1970. And he's going to be on here next week. He's going to be a guest at the Oregon Medical Cannabis Awards. The Oregon Medical Cannabis Awards, for those of you out there who don't know, is a uh, award banquet that takes place annually. This is going to be the fifth annual OMCA, or Oregon Medical Cannabis Awards. It takes place at Ambridge uh, Convention Center, right next to the Portland Convention Center on uh, MLK, uh, very close to the downtown area. And so it uh, will happen all day next Saturday, uh, the 15th of December. That's Saturday 15th at the Ambridge uh, Convention Center. I know there are tickets available at the door. I think uh, there's a ticket to see all the exhibits, and, and it's an all-day event from 9 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon. And then there's an awards banquet dinner uh, that you have to buy a separate ticket to go to. 
uh, that will be in the evening. And so what happens with the Oregon Medical Cannabis Awards is 28 people uh, are judges, and they get 28 samples of cannabis, and they get about uh, a month to sample those 28 samples and rate them, and then uh, Oregon Normal takes all those rating booklets and compiles uh, the statistics and awards the, the highest, uh, they have a first, second, and third place winner. And they also award uh, some ribbons for the be outside of the top three winners uh, for the best taste, best potency, best aroma, and other things like that. I know they've developed a poster of the various 28 samples that uh, uh, had been uh, submitted for this year's uh, Oregon Medical Cannabis Award. So that's the way it works. I look forward to meeting you. And you know, it's a really fun event. I've always greatly enjoyed these things. Uh, I've been to every one of them, and it's going to be uh, next Saturday, the 15th of December at the Ambridge Convention Center. You can find out more about it on Oregon Normal site, and that's O R. N O R M L dot O R G. O R N O R M L dot O R G. And that's the big thing coming up this month. Yep, that is indeed. I'm looking forward to it. Also, tomorrow, for our viewers out there watching the live show, for patients, there's the patient only uh, cannabis meeting that Oregon Normal puts on at Mount Tabor Theater. That's at the corner of Southeast 49th and Hawthorne. The Mount Tabor Theater, uh, it's for patients only. Patients, uh, various people, myself and others, bring in donations of medicine and uh, cuttings. Then those cuttings or baby plants are given to the patients there that need them. So it's a good way for patients to uh, participate. Admission to that's free, but you do have to have an annual membership to the uh, Oregon Normal Chapter. And I think that's about 35 bucks a year. And, they have these once or twice a month. I think they're going to go to twice a month starting next uh, next month. But thanks for bringing that up. Hey, my pleasure, Paul. You all have a nice, nice evening and a nice weekend. Thank you. Thanks for your call. If you're out there, we've got oh, about another 10, 12 minutes left here, so you can call us at uh, 503-288-4448. That's 503-288-4448. Let's bring out that list of conditions with the graphics there we'll go through if you're out there and you think that you or a loved one someone you know might qualify for medical marijuana the largest single category of patients are patients with a chronic pain condition largely that uh, includes many different uh, conditions but a lot of folks with bulging compacted discs in their back various fractures of their vertebrae uh, and a lot of other painful conditions uh, people with uh, a severe and chronic nausea, that could come from uh, hepatitis or a number of gastrointestinal ailments. Of course, people with AIDS, with glaucoma, IBS or irritable bowel syndrome is uh, one of the conditions. Uh, seizure disorders like epilepsy and spastic disorders like multiple sclerosis or other neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or Lou Gehrig's disease also qualify. Asthma qualifies as a spastic condition. GERD, which is uh, gastrointestinal reflux disease. Hepatitis C causes uh, nausea and uh, pain and uh, loss of appetite. Loss of appetite is another one of the qualifying conditions. If you're out there and uh, you think you or a loved one might have one of those conditions and want to try medical marijuana, you can call our number. Here in Portland, that number is 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. If you're up in the Seattle area, we have a Seattle number that's 206-878-1701. That's 206-878-1701. This television show is the number one show on cable access in Denver, according to the Denver uh, cable people there. And so if you're watching in Denver, we have a Denver office. The number in Denver is 303-403-9996. That's 303-403-9996. If you're out there watching it in any of the other communities where we're running, which in includes Ashland and, and Salem and Spokane, then you can call our toll-free number. We actually can help you find doctors to help you for medical marijuana throughout the western United States in 
Colorado, Nevada, California, Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii. You can call us at 1-800-723-0188. That's 1-800-723-0188. And we have uh, voicemail. Just leave a message there, and someone will get back to you in the next day or so if you don't get someone on the phone immediately. So that's the end of the plug there, but I think we have another caller. Hello, caller. You're on the show. Hi. Good evening. Um, I have a question I want to ask. Um, I spent some time being homeless, and I have a, just gotten back into a home. Yippee. Congratulations. Thanks. And part of the, the reason I, I mentioned that is because we were pretty darn broke for that whole time, obviously. Sure. Yeah. And so I was not able to see a doctor, but I have a most certainly verifiable, I mean, permanent condition. Uh-huh. I have spinal injury. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm, I'm finding... <sighs> How hard is it to get in to see somebody when my medical documentation is probably about a year and a half, almost two years old? That's okay. I know that uh, the doctors that we have in Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and Hawaii just require medical documentation that's less than three years old. And oh, so well, that's an x-ray wonderful. report about your spinal injury, any recent treatment notes, that's what the doctor would need. So you definitely would qualify for a medical cannabis permit. Oh, if you're on the wonderful. Oregon Health Plan or on Social Security Supplemental Security Income, there's a state fee involved in Oregon's program, and that state fee for people on those two programs is just $20. For everyone else, it's $100 annually. And that's a fee that has to be paid to the Oregon Department of Health for to have them issue the permit. But if you have either the Oregon Health Plan or SSI, then it's a $20 fee. Otherwise, it's a $100 annual fee. All right, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the call. Have a good night. You too. Well, I'm happy to announce that we're on the verge of finally having another copy of our Hemp News newspaper out there. We've got it coming out for January and February, and we'll have more of these to show in the coming weeks, so just stay tuned for that. We'll see that out there and in the good public's hands again. So if you have a question for us, gee, we have maybe four or five minutes left here. We can take a call at... 503-288-4448. 503-288-4448. You know, I haven't tried these bagels yet, but they do look really, really tasty. It says they come with shelled hemp seed, flax seed, pumpkin seed, and they're an all-natural source of nutrients. It uh, looks pretty darn tasty. Hey, we've got another call. Hello, caller. You're on the show. Yeah, how you doing? Real well. How are you? i got a question. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if it's, you know, really matters, but it kind of bothered me because I was supposed to have a surgery uh -huh. for my uh, abnoids, uh -huh. and I went to the ENT doctor. Uh -huh. And, you know, they ask you if you do drugs or anything like that, and the surgery was already aligned on the 17th of this month, and I told her, you know, I got a bad back, and I don't take Vicodins or Percocets. I do got the organ medical marijuana, and I eat it. And then she looked at me like you know, so, like, really low, and they're like, you know what, I don't want to even do the surgery. I mean, why does people, I mean, is it so against it, or... She's I mean, just completely me ignorant. You know, if you wait on the line once you get off there, I'll have somebody, I'd love to call and talk to that doctor. Yeah, you because, know, I mean, I, and I was... That doctor needs to be educated. I waited for, like, six months for this surgery. And That's just outrageous. And it is, it is, it you know, is. I've heard similar cases, something even just as, as bad or maybe even worse, people who are on the liver transplant list have been kicked off because they've used medical marijuana. Unbelievable. That's basically a death sentence. I don't get that. I mean, it, it, she just looked at me like, you know, then she walked out, and then she had her nurse or whatever came back and said, you know, if she don't want to do the surgery, you need to look for another physician. Now I'm on a waiting list again for another three months. You know, I think you've got a lawsuit against that lady. You might uh, go talk to a lawyer about uh, pursuing some legal recourse there. I mean, I'm not 100% certain, and I know those things are expensive and time-consuming, but a lot of times that's the only way to wake these folks up. They're completely ignorant. Yeah, that's I, where I, I'd like just an opportunity to try to talk to them and, and educate them about the medical efficacy of cannabis. We started this show with uh, uh, news stories just from the past couple of weeks that show 
how cannabis is an effective medicine for a number of different conditions. They talked about brain cancer, breast cancer, uh -huh. MS, and and other conditions that medical cannabis works for. I just and, don't. I just didn't understand. She treated me like, oh my god. I've heard I mean, of that happen. She's just ignorant, really. She just doesn't really know, and she's been taught uh, by people who who probably t gave her misinformation. It was weird because I talked to my MD doctor. My MD doctor started laughing. He didn't even. He told me, you know what? Find yourself another doctor. Yeah. Because I asked him if it has anything to do with the surgery. He told me no. It shouldn't have nothing. Absolutely to do with nothing. It. Absolutely nothing. But it's just outrageous that she would do that. Yeah, I like I say, I'd like to know who that is, and I'd like to give her a piece of my mind. Please. Please. Yeah. We'll stay on the phone, and we'll have uh, Andrew, who's our call screener, pick that up. Okay. All right. Thanks for calling. That makes me mad, John. I don't like to hear things like that. You know, that's sad. You know, especially for people with liver transplants. They tell no, you know, you can't get your liver transplant. With this fellow, I mean, it's going to be a painful wait. But for some people, it's, it can literally be a death sentence. And that's why we're here fighting in that type of ignorance, by showing these antiques, reading the news articles from the latest uh, medical journals, and uh, trying to educate everyone so they can, can tell their doctors and tell their friends that... Uh, it's time to end adult marijuana prohibition and restore industrial hemp, and we're here to help medical marijuana patients too. In fact, that's the whole purpose and the goal of our foundation is to end adult marijuana prohibition. And we have an initiative campaign that will go into circulation next summer, the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act, that would tax and regulate the sale of marijuana to adults, allow industrial hemp to be grown, people could grow their own without a license, so stay tuned for that petition. We're going to try to just end this madness here in Oregon with a vote in 2010 to legalize it in 2011. So I want to thank you all for watching another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We're going to go out with another song from Mr. John Cornett. Uh, stay tuned. Check out our website at hemp.org. We've made it into a portal to our, our Cannabis Museum and all our other sites. You can actually watch this show online, too. And tune in next week as we bring you another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. Remember to help us restore hemp. Good night.